Afternoon. Oh, you sound so happy. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to talk about a couple of different things here. And uh, Dr. Garrison asked me to talk a little bit about leadership, ag leadership, and also about media message. I'm going to try to tie some of that together and tell you a little, hopefully, a humorous story here. I've been on this campus since I was seven years old. My Just dad started working here. Just a couple of years. It's been a while, okay? So it's been since the late 1960s since I've been on this campus, in some way, shape, or form. And one of the fads that was going on amongst college students in the early 1970s, does someone have any idea? Take a wild guess what that fad was. College students usually did it late in the evening when it was dark. Assassin. What? Assassin. No, no, no. <laughs> uh, 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 dragons, Dungeons and Dragons was the big deal when I was in college. That was a little bit later. But you, hey, you're on the right track now. And there wasn't such thing as video games. Well, no, we, the, no we, we had Pong. We had to go to the Cats and Best Off to, uh, to play it. So, any, any other guesses? It was streaky. <laughs> so when you would drive through campus at night and me and my buddies because we were in junior high we were excited to try to drive through campus at night to get our parents to for two reasons number one it was funny just to see someone running all over the place butt naked okay all right and they usually ran in groups okay okay you can't get away with this today because they'll kick you out of school today. But then they didn't get kicked out of school. That was the beauty of it. And, uh, and the other thing is you knew it ticked your parents off. So it was a win-win for everyone that was my age at that time. Now, I told you, I feel like Ron White, the comedian. I'm telling you that story to tell you this story. And no, my nickname's not Tater Salad. Okay? Uh, Ron White. As you know, did all that funny story. And I, I turns out I have a pretty good friend, and I come to find out not too long ago, he was one of those guys. And not only that, he was one of the, the guys that got other people to do it. He used to get these groups together, and they just go streaking all throughout campus. Okay, in fact, they had someone do it at a basketball game. That did not end well. Okay, it did not end well. I let me just let you know right now. And he told me this story, okay? And believe it or not, it ties into leadership, all right? Here's the story he told me. He had a group, a new group, about 20 of them, all together, all right? And they're starting out in the basement of the dorm room, and there's a door right by the basement, okay? I don't remember which dorm. He told me at the time, I don't remember. And of course, they all start off with their towels on, and then you're just gonna run outside and start going. And they have a place that they're gonna run to, and they have a path they're gonna run back so they don't get caught, okay? Because if the police did see you, they would catch you, all right? They would arrest you. And so he says, are y'all ready? And everyone says, you're ready. And he runs out the door, and what's the first sound he hears? He, no, it's worse than that. He heard the door close behind him. And no one else was there. And it was locked. <laughs> Yeah, he felt pretty lonely at that moment, didn't he? But he was smart, because he thought this was a possibility, since he had been doing this a while, and he had clothes set aside outside the door, okay? So he put his clothes back on, and he goes around to the front of the building, goes back to the lobby, and a bunch of the people were over there already, kind of laughing, and they see him. And then they go, that, that, we, we just, uh, a couple of people backed out, and then we didn't do it, and then we all decided not to do it. Sorry, man. Well, a little bit later, he convinced them all to go streaking. Now, that's a, a bizarre form of leadership, but I want you to tell me, why do you think they eventually followed him? Let's see, does this work? I have some in my bag. Oh, this is good. You got it? Okay. Why? Did they actually follow him out there? Keep in mind, butt naked, they followed him outside. <laughs> now think about that. Give me a couple of reasons why you think they did that. Just to do it. They, they wanted to be part of something, right? Okay. Part of something? What else? Maybe he was a good speaker, so they would have convinced them. Good 
good speaker. He was a good communicator. You probably have to be a pretty good communicator to convince people to take their clothes off and go out in public, right? Okay. Yeah, that, that, that would be a good, that's a very good example. What else? Come on, think. Boredom? <laughs> they probably were bored. I mean, you know, that does happen. He was in control. He was in control. So if he had come back with his clothes on and started railing on everyone, were they going to follow him back outside? No. Yes, sir? Because they knew he meant business. He did it. He was serious. They saw him do it first. He was committed to doing it, right? Right. He was committed. I can't spell worth a flip. Never could. Thank goodness for spell check. Sometimes it gets you in trouble, though. Just reread everything. That's all I got to say. <laughs> Any other reason? Bless you. Any other reason? No other reason? Come on. He believed in it. He believed in it. There was a belief. Okay, that's enough for right now. By the way, the only reason I keep this up here, this is my only watch, so I, I make sure that I'm on time. There's so many facets to leadership. Sooner or later, one day, you're going to be in charge of something. How do you lead people when you're in charge of something? I didn't hear Confident. You're confident. What else? By example. By example, okay. But sooner or later, and those are good, those are good answers. Sooner or later, you're going to be in charge of something. How do you convince others to do what you want to do? Because you're obviously going to have an idea of what you want to do. Unless you're the type of leader that says, I haven't a clue, someone else take over. And that does happen because you're in a position of leadership, but you might not be a good leader. So what I want you to think about is maybe some of the reasons why you follow others, why others are good leaders. And we talked about one of the reasons, and it was this one right here, and that's communication. So what I'm going to do right now is talk a little bit about communication and expand on that a little bit. Has anyone here gotten in front of a camera like this and spoken in front of a camera? Yes, no? Okay, one, two, three, four, a handful. Was it for a media thing or was it just a post on Facebook? It was for a class. Class? A ceremony. What kind of ceremony? Huh? Student of, the year. Student of the year. So you had to get in front of the audience and everything and present? <coughs> Were you scared? Yeah. Good. You should be. Okay? Everyone should be nervous when they get in front of a group. You just have to learn not to show it. That's one thing about communicating in front of a group of people. And that's one of the fears of media. When people talk about media... There are many different types of media today. There's newspaper. There are traditional media. And so if you're talking to a newspaper person, it's just two people talking to each other. There's radio, okay? That's just a microphone. And then there's TV. And there's one thing to be quoted as saying something stupid. There's one thing, someone hearing you saying something stupid. But it's a whole other ballgame when someone sees you and hears you and gets to play it back over and over again of someone doing something stupid. Okay? And some of it's comical, some of it's tragic. Okay? So, one of my messages here today is whether you're doing media or not, no matter where you go, even if it's a, not a public presentation, 
even if it's a one-on-one -on -one presentation with someone very important, there are a few things you should think about before you ever open your mouth. I'm going to give you a few tips. This is what, let me give you a little explanation. She told you I did about 14 and a half years in uh, television. I did advertising. My job was not news media. My job was to make people look good. So I know what makes people look good. I know what makes people look bad. Okay? I've seen it. I've seen someone hyperlate, hyperventilate on live TV. I've seen it all, just about. Okay? I've seen people who get paid really good money to be on TV because they're just that good. All right? And I've also done a lot of political advertising over my career. When I was in TV, that was about 35% of our business was political advertising. I learned a lot. I saw a lot of people who were really nice, wanted to do well, really believed in what they were, but they could not communicate worth a flip. And they didn't know a few basic things. So here's the first thing I want to say to you. If you know you're going to talk to a group or anything, I want you to have what we call some key points. Okay? Or key messages. Either phrase. <coughs> there are two or three things that you should say in that conversation. Two or three. No more. Why? Take a wild guess. People don't want to process too much information. Okay. You don't want people to have to process too much information. People used to tell me when I did commercials for a living, I can't tell that story. I said, heck, I can tell your story in 15 seconds. I can tell my story in 15 seconds if I had to. It's not as difficult as you think. And the other aspect of that, so two or three messages, two to three, okay? Now, if you're having to do an hour presentation, you can go in much more depth. But it doesn't mean you have to spread too many messages in there. You just can go in much more depth in each one. What's most important to you? And never hesitate to say what's most important. Okay? Never hesitate to say that. That is if you figure it out. If you're just going over there and you're just talking smack left and right, guess what? It's obvious. To someone like me, it's real obvious. So, the other thing is to simplify what you said. Simplify your message. Now, some people say it's dumbing down the message. I disagree with that. I think anyone who is an educator has to simplify the message so that people can learn more. Then you can get into more depth. You know, there are intro classes before you take the advanced class, correct? Guess what? What's the intro class? It's the simplified version of what you're going to take advanced. So once you get into that advanced class, you have more depth. It's the same principle. So you have to simplify that message, no matter what it is, no matter how long it is. Okay? That's one other aspect of it. The other thing I would say, as opposed to just simplifying it, let me give you a few tips. If you were ever on camera, okay? If you're ever approached on camera, let's just say it's Tiger, is it called Tiger TV? Okay. It wasn't called that when I got my mass comm degree, okay? Um, there's the camera right there. Do you ever look into the camera when you're being interviewed by someone with the camera? Yes or no? Uh, Why? Okay. Creepy is a great word. Thank you so much. Okay, if you're the reporter, I'm looking right at you, and there's the camera. Let me tell you what someone getting an interview does who's very nervous, okay? They start answering, they just start doing this, and they just start doing this, and they keep doing this, and they keep doing this, and they're talking back and forth. And you know what the people at home are going? What the heck are they looking at? Is there something wrong? Or they have a twitch, or they get nervous, or they start playing with their hands just like this. Sooner or later, watch a morning show. You'll see someone play with a microphone sooner or later. And guess what? It doesn't sound good when they start doing that. They're nervous. Someone mentioned about leadership being confident. Okay? 
you have to be self-confident at all times when you're speaking from people. Whether you're scared, petrified, as you were earlier at the presentation you did, it does not matter. You have to show that you're a little bit self-confident. Uh, I'll translate this to something else, and then I'll talk a little bit about some of the programming I do. What's the most important speech that you will make just before or right after you graduate? Most important presentation, let me put it that way. Like a grad interview? Nah, that's not that's not that's not more important than what I'm asking. Come on. What do you plan to do when you graduate? Someone said it. Job. Get a job. Or are you just gonna walk up and say, yo, dude, I need work. Is that what you're going to do? No. You're going to market yourself. At that moment, you are a commodity. How you market yourself dictates what you get. Start thinking about that today. How do I market myself? I mean, am I going to go up and try to get a job wearing a tie-dye t-shirt? Shorts that have holes in them and flip-flops. Unless the guy interviewing you is wearing the same thing, guess what? You have not marketed yourself well. Don't think I haven't seen it. Okay? Don't think I haven't seen it. So that is something you have to take your own leadership amongst yourself. And deal with. And whether you ever do media messages, and let me tell you, what goes on now with social media, don't ever think that can come back to haunt you. Because don't think companies don't go on your Facebook page and start looking. All right? Don't ever think that. Or if you got a Twitter account, that's all they got to do is see what you've been doing. You're letting them know. Think about how you market yourself at all times. You're in a time in which people can see more of what you do than any other generation before you. So you can put yourself in a good or a bad position. So if on your Twitter account you're saying, hey, I'm going to go help this uh, group at such and such place. I'm really enjoying the volunteer work. Hey, an employer likes that. Me and my buddies are going to get together and we're going to tie one on tonight. It's not the best impression. Okay? Just keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. Let me tell you a little bit about some of the programming I do. Uh, the main program I have is the Ag Leadership Program. Why do we have Ag Leadership? Why is it important for this institution to do something with Ag Leadership? Agricultural leadership. These are all College of Ag students, right? Okay. Someone yelled it out, and someone caught the message. Do you know what it means that this is a land grant institution? Yes, no? Raise your hand if you know. Okay. Why? Why is this a land grant institution? the full name of this institution? I almost shed a tear. Almost did. Okay, so we are an A&M, okay? Agricultural and mechanical. There's at least one in every state in this country. The federal government loaned land, gave land to the state so they can start an institution. That's how this institution started. That's why we have a big college of ag. That's why. It's why we exist as an institution. And in that, every one of these institutions has agricultural research and agricultural extension. Okay? The Cooperative Extension Service. Okay? And as part of agricultural extension, 
What we started seeing in the 1960s is that in state governments, there were a lot of policies that started being affecting a lot of people in production agriculture. <coughs> now, I am a firm believer of what I'm about to say. Firm believer. There are two things that make a country strong. Okay? And you have to have either one or the other. And right now in this world, no one has both. Okay? Can someone take a wild guess at what I'm talking about? Two things that a country has to be really, really good at. Agriculture. Agriculture is one. That was a no-brainer. What's the other one? What, what else would make you wealthy as a son of a gun? What? Energy. Are we a strong country energy-wise? No. We have chosen as a society not to be. Okay? I'm not going to get into that debate. Are we a strong country agriculturally? Yes. We are a dominant country agriculturally. And it is why we have a good position in terms of trade. <coughs> and it is important to have leadership that supports that so that we can continue having that strong position. Do not think that is not important. Do not think it is not important. So, when a country that has neither, what are they dependent on? Somebody else. They're dependent on someone else. And so, hence, that is why we have things such as ag leadership. And the reason, the other reason is, in our society over the last hundred years in particular, this is probably, this is pretty close to the percentage of people in this country that are in production agriculture. One percent. That's not a whole lot of people, is it? So, when a lot of people are away from the farm, I didn't grow up on a farm. Both my parents did. Both my parents made me understand that. I had to identify every day I got crop when we got on the road. Okay? It was just part of what I, the way I was raised. So, uh, did we grow stuff? Yeah, we would grow stuff. Uh, we didn't grow it on a large scale, though. So I have a great appreciation for what they can do and what they can accomplish. But I'm a firm believer that a country has to have one or the other in order to have some impact. Let's make it clear. Is Saudi Arabia ever going to dominate agriculture? No. No. Why? It's a desert. <laughs> that does not mean that they can't have a great greenhouse system if they want it. Because who has probably the best greenhouse system, agriculturally speaking, in the world? Take a wild guess. close. They're phenomenal. They're the best at water conservation, you name it. It's one of the reasons they stay alive. They can feed themselves when everyone around them wants to kill them. They're phenomenal in water conservation. They really are. And I'm not trying to make a political statement. This is the way it is. So, these two things are very important in our society, and how we get to those, that's a whole other debate. But part of the reason for ag leadership <coughs> is so that we can remain the power that we are. Higher yields on fewer acres than anyone else in the world. That's who we are as a country. We absolutely kick butt, everyone's butt when it comes to that. We're very efficient and very productive. And there's a lot of policy, but because there's only 1%, there are a lot of people that really don't comprehend what it takes and how much it takes. And it doesn't mean that there aren't issues that aren't important for people like environmental groups or whatever. That's not the point. The point is the reason for leadership programs like the one that I use is to have a better understanding of what others go through and what they have to do to become better spokespeople for what they believe. 
and that is part of what I do. We just got back from South America, and it's phenomenal to see another country. Uh, we went to two countries. We went to Chile and Argentina. Chile is a really cool country. It's a beautiful country. Similar climate to what you see in Central California. Uh, a lot of the same production. They're our number two trade partner in terms of fruits and vegetables, second to Mexico. So they're very important to us because their summertime is right now. So we're getting a lot of product from them when California cannot produce it. Because otherwise we're getting it from California for the most part. And so that's important. Uh, a lot of the pr uh, food that we eat, it is a probably the best run government in South America. That's important to know. When you have a good trade partner, you want a well run government. They have a very good banking system. People can actually borrow money and pay it back to the bank. You think that's silly? We go over to Argentina. No one uses the banking system. You know why? Because every once in a while the government says, you know what? We need more money. We're going to take it from the banks and you don't get it back. Now, agriculturally, Argentina is some of the most fertile, rich soils in the world. Phenomenal. But you know what their corporate tax on soybeans is? Corporate tax off the top. This might not mean anything to you because many of you are not paying taxes yet. It is 35%. Right off the top. If you do not own the land, and most that produce do not own the land, it's other big landowners, if you do not own the land, the person who owns the land automatically gets 48% of what you produce. So do you think that's a good system to build up economic development amongst the populace? And the answer is no. So as great agriculturally as they can be, and they are, what they can produce is just as good as what we can produce in the Midwest, where we have the most fertile soils in our country. They are as dysfunctional as they can be in their federal system. And that's important to know, because you know who to compete with and why you can compete with them. And you also know who to be wary of in certain situations. And that's part of what I do. Um, I have a few minutes left. If anyone has any questions for me, I'm more than happy to answer them. And I greatly appreciate your time. Thank you so much. No streaking. No streaking. I don't want to hear that I told you that. But you might ask your parents if they were one of the ones, okay? All right.